Welcome to Module 3, MTSS Essential Component, Database Decision Making. Before we get started, have you printed the Module 3 Participant Workbook? If not, please press pause and download the Participant Workbook. There are activities that are part of this module that will need to be completed in the workbook. This module, MTSS Essential Component Database Decision Making, is the third of seven modules about multi-tiered systems of support, or MTSS. The remaining four modules will introduce you to other essential components. The content presented in this session should in no way be viewed as exhaustive or legally binding. You should continue to seek and participate in ongoing professional development related to the topics presented in this session and in future sessions. By the end of this session, participants will be able to understand the types of database decisions educators make in a multi-tiered system of support, develop a school-wide MTSS team to support school-wide implementation, and understand the importance of a clearly defined written decision rules and identify components of the problem-solving method. MTSS in Wyoming is a prevention framework for school improvement made up of four essential components. The four components are screening, multi-level prevention, you may have heard of this previously, progress monitoring, and database decision-making. MTSS in Wyoming also encompasses features such as culturally responsive instruction, family engagement, and evidence-based instruction. As you will notice in the graphic, each of the components and features contribute together to improve student outcomes. In this session, we will focus our conversation on database decision-making, which is at the heart of the graphic. Before we move forward, think to yourself, how are you currently using database decision-making? What kinds of data are you using? Is it primarily academic, or is it behavior, or both? And think about the decisions you're making with your data. We'll use this information to connect to new information presented in this session. In this section, we'll share the different types of data decisions educators make in a multi-tiered system of support, and identify the essential components of a problem-solving model. Database decision-making is part of the problem-solving process. We use data to examine the effectiveness of our instruction, determine students' needs, set measurable goals, and implement the right strategies and programs. As part of database decision-making, we also prioritize the use of resources so we can engage in these tasks. These are the more common types of instruction that schools make using an MTSS framework. First is instruction. How effective is what we're doing for students? What instructional changes are needed? To evaluate the effectiveness, we ask questions such as, is the core curriculum effective for most students? Is one intervention more effective than another? Movement within a multi-level prevention system helps us answer how do we know when a student no longer needs Tier 2 prevention or Tier 3 um, intensive intervention. And finally, we can use data decision making to ask questions such as how do we know if a student should be referred or is eligible for uh, IDEA and how do we make decisions about disability identification in accordance to our state law. Data analysis occurs at all levels of RTI and MTSS implementation. Decisions are based on established routines and procedures. It is helpful for schools and districts to have explicit decision rules in writing in place when analyzing data. Writing down the processes helps to ensure consistency despite changes in data team members, and it also allows data team members to ensure that they follow the same process and rules with all students, regardless of their class, age, or grade. Decision rules should be established at all levels of decision-making, 
including at the district, school, grade, class, and individual student. Before we can engage in student-level decision-making, we must engage in system-level decision-making. The primary purpose is to evaluate the effectiveness of the system. Failure to analyze the effects of the system using Tier 1 data can lead teams to incorrectly focus on student characteristics as the, poor, as the cause for poor learning outcomes. In most cases, poor learning outcomes are the result of a mismatch between the student's needs and the instruction, curriculum, or environment. Consider the following as you analyze your data. Are the teaching and learning well articulated within the district, school, grade, and class so that students have similar high quality experiences regardless of where they are in their school, grade, or teacher? You may recall that we discussed school level teaming structures in module one. This graphic shows the teaming structure in a district-wide MTSS implementation. At each benchmark, the district team first reviews the data to engage in problem solving around any identified system issues. The school team then reviews the data to engage in problem solving around any school-wide system issues. After the district and school have begun action planning around identified issues, the grade level teams can begin problem solving to improve grade level performance. These teams focus primarily on Tier 1 and Tier 2 instruction, as well as the curriculum. In some cases, students may not be responding to the prevention efforts at Tier 1 and Tier 2. In these cases, students may be referred to a student problem solving team to identify additional Tier 3 interventions and supports. Later in this module, we'll talk more about the problem-solving process, which is integrated into each level of teaming shown on this slide. Explicit decision rules are needed to guide decision-making for MTSS teams. Both school and grade-level teams should, should establish explicit decision rules for evaluating Tier 1 data. For example, we can consider articulating in writing what happens when more than 80% of students are above the cut score. And what happens if less than 80% of students have reached the cut score or lack of progress is evident? We'll also want to know what to do when student progress varies across target groups. Do we supplement target group instruction or do we consider evaluating our entire program? In this section, we'll talk about the components of the problem-solving method recommended by the Wyoming Department of Education. In order to effectively and appropriately use database decision-making within an MTSS framework, it's helpful to implement a four-step problem-solving method. The problem-solving process in MTSS has four simple steps. The first is to define the problem and determine the goal. A guiding question for determining the goal is, what is the difference between the expectation and what is actually occurring in terms of student performance? Determine the gap or difference between the expectation and what is actually occurring. The second step is to analyze the problem. The guiding questions for this step are things like, why is the problem occurring? Teams create hypotheses based on root cause analysis about why the problem may be occurring. Carefully teams carefully analyze additional data to support or refute each of the hypotheses they've identified. They use additional data to validate whether it's an accurate or likely hypothesis. The third step, which is implement the plan, helps us determine what should be done. With teams, uh, staff determine what can be done to solve the problem. Your team may want to brainstorm and select the intervention or strategies that could be put in place to address the problem. Finally, teams need to evaluate the plan, in most cases using progress monitoring or screening data, to determine if the plan worked or not. You should refer to handout 3.1 in the packet to look more closely at each of the steps. 
In the participant workbook, there's a one-page descriptor for each of the steps in the problem-solving process. Use those resources to follow along in the following slides. The first step in the problem-solving process is to use your school data to identify a goal or desired outcome. Your team will determine this goal by analyzing screening data and other school-wide data. Your team will want to look at other students or at students' current performance in comparison to their peers as well as in comparison to the benchmark. By doing this gap analysis and identifying where you want your student to perform in comparison to where they're actually performing, your team will be able to set a more realistic goal. In the following slides, we'll review primary data results together and identify potential problem areas. What are some of the examples of primary data sources you use when you're identifying a problem? Consider your state tests, your screening data, or large, other large-scale data sets that you have in your district. We're going to engage in a process of reviewing data and then identifying trends or patterns as a group with fictitious data before you have an opportunity to examine fictitious data or real data with your team. It is important to provide a sufficient description when defining the problem. You want to provide the measure, the target population, the time frame, and the expectation. An example of a good definition would be during the fall semester, which provides the time frame, School A recorded 792 office discipline referrals. That's the measure. The expectation is no more than 200 for the school year, which would be our expectation. With screening data, individual students' performance data can be compared with the norm, which is the box plots, and the target score, which is the black line. When reviewing this data, what problems do you see? If you look at the green boxes, you can see that the group, the class or the grade, appears to be making progress over time. Although the student, shown with the blue dots and the blue line, is making some progress, his progress appears to be insufficient to close the gap or keep up with his peers. In fact, if you look closely, it appears that the gap may actually be increasing, as shown by the increasing difference between the 50th percentile of the peer group and the student's benchmark score. Think about what you see might be the focus of our problem solving. Would it be the student or the class, the comparison group? In this case, we'd probably problem solve around the student since most kids are performing well and this kid is performing differently. Database decision making in an MTSS framework should also take behavior data into account. Here's some behavior data in the form of office disciplinary referrals presented by grade then by year. What problems do you see? Some positives is we see a decrease by third grade, but what we do notice is that the number of office disciplinary referrals are increasing for both fourth grade and fifth grade. Here are sample data gathered by the Student Risk Screening Scale, or the SRSS, a free behavior screener discussed in Module 2. The SRSS data are used to help identify students who are at risk for externalizing and internalizing problem behaviors, similar to the screening of students for academic risk. Students' risk status is characterized as low, which is green, moderate, which is yellow, and red, which is high. Similar to academic screeners, we expect at least 80% of students to be at low risk indicated in green. In reviewing this data, what do you notice? Think about how you might define the problem that you see. Your definition of the problem may depend on your school, on where you are in your school. If you're a classroom teacher, you may be more concerned about the classroom problem 
where if you're a principal, you may be more concerned about the school-wide problem. Let's review some additional data. What do you see in these Tier 1 grade level data? The expectation for each benchmark is 80% of students are at or above target or in the green. Think about the problem you see. How the problem is defined determines the type of intervention or strategy we might select or the target areas we might focus on. For example, we could define the problem we saw with the previous data as only 62% of third graders are at or above target on the Dibbles or Whitting fluency during spring benchmarking. And the expectation was 80% at or above target. In this case, we're focusing on just spring. We could also look at this from a different perspective and focus on the differences between winter and spring. Only 60% of incoming third graders met expectation for readiness for third grade. The expectation is 80. So in this case, we're more concerned about the preparation of kids coming into third grade. Thus, our intervention is likely to focus on end of year second grade and students coming into third grade. The last example, from fall to spring, the percentage of students at or above target only increased by 2%. Given the baseline, the goal was 20%. Defining our problem like this would likely lead us to focus on interventions throughout third grade. There is no right or wrong answer. Teams should define the problem that represents the issue of concern for the target population at the time of review. Setting an appropriate goal requires thinking about the expected levels of performance, current levels of performance, and the peer levels of performance. Questions you might ask are, what is the benchmark and expected level? Or, how is my student performing in comparison to that expected level? Here are some examples. In the first problem, the school identified that only 37% of first graders are at or above target on Dibbles or Reading Fluency during the winter benchmarking. The expectation was 85% at or above target. A realistic goal might be by spring benchmarking, 46% of first grade students will be at or above target Dibbles or Reading Fluency. Although we would like to have 85% of students at or above target, we have to compare to the, the growth rate, the national growth rate, or peers within our district or school. During the fall for problem two, school A recorded 792 ODRs. The expectation was no more than 200 for the school year. In this case, a realistic goal might be to reduce the number of ODRs to fewer than 400 during the spring semester. The team may choose this based on expectations from previous interventions or the growth rates that we would expect on research that supports the interventions they'll select. In your participant workbook, you'll see Activity 3.2 which has several data sets, including a school office referral and behavior data set, a grade level screening data set, and a school-wide benchmark data set. These activities are designed to allow you to examine data on your own and answer a series of reflective questions. Consider pausing the module and completing the activities. Now that we've defined the problem and set our goal, the next step is to engage in problem analysis. Teams often rush through this step and move too quickly to the intervention because they assume they know why the problem is occurring. Implementing the wrong strategy or intervention can lead to increased teacher frustration, lost instructional time, and worse, 
continued poor outcomes for learners. It is important that the problem analysis focus on variables that are educationally relevant and alterable. We want to avoid admiring the problem and instead focus on variables we can change, such as instruction, curriculum, and the environment. The next step is to identify possible root causes of the identified problem and gather more data to analyze and validate the hypotheses. Teams can then develop informed statements about why the desired behavior is not occurring. An example could be only 37% of first graders are scoring at or above target on oral reading fluency because they lack sufficient opportunities to practice reading orally. By providing a hypothesis, we can better select an intervention to address the identified issue. The ISO by Riot framework is a framework for engaging in problem analysis. You can use this handout to walk through the ISO and Riot activities in the next slide. Developing appropriate hypotheses requires the team to look deeper into the root causes of the problem. It requires identifying possible root causes and then answering why the goal has not been attained. You'll need to analyze and validate using supplemental data your hypotheses. If available, find your team and brainstorm possible root causes around an issue you may have. Write each of your possible root causes on a sticky note. Judy Elliott in 2016 described step two in the problem solving process as a time when you develop the hypothesis and look at the problem through the lens of key domains of learning, which are instruction, curriculum, environment, and the learner, ISIL. The I is instruction, which is how the curriculum is taught. The C is curriculum, which is what is taught, or the content. E is the environment, or where the instruction takes place. And L is the learner, which is the student being taught. By looking at the problem in these different areas, your MTSS team can get more targeted view of the reasons why the problem is occurring. Use your data or the fictitious data provided in Activity 3.2 to look at a problem through the lens of the key domains of learning presented on this slide. To complete the activity, the ISO activity, create four boxes on a sheet of paper or chart paper and label the corners with the I, the C, the E, and the L. Instruction, curriculum, environment, and learner. As a team, divide the post it notes with your potential root causes into these four categories. Refer to the ISO by Riot framework handout for descriptions and other considerations. As you place them, you'll start to see trends and where your data may end up. Using that data, teams can say it's likely to be an instruction issue and then brainstorm about interventions to address instruction. Once all the root causes have been sorted, you'll use these inf this information to develop two to three hypotheses about potential root causes. Once you develop the root causes, the next step is to use data or collect new data to validate or invalidate the hypotheses. Why should we validate hypotheses? If the hypothesis is incorrect and a wrong intervention is implemented, valuable time is wasted on an intervention that was not an appropriate instructional match for the student. So the next step is then to support and refute each of your hypotheses. The RIOT acronym presents a systematic approach to doing this. It's always helpful to gather more data in order to get a more holistic view of the problem. RIOT stands for R Review, which is review school records and other historical accounts. The I for interview is interview key stakeholders, which could be the student, the parent, and other teachers and peers. 
The O is for observe. Observe the environment to confirm the hypothesis in real time. And just like you would do in other research, the T is test. Test the hypothesis before you invest a lot of time and money in an intervention. Step three is to develop a plan and implement. The purpose is to really select and implement a system support or an intervention that is focused on what to teach, how best to teach it, and how to monitor progress. A good guiding question is, what is the simplest thing we can do with the greatest impact? System supports or interventions must be based upon data, knowledge gained through the problem identification, and research-based practices. The team will also have to determine how fidelity of implementation will be measured, how progress will be monitored, and a specific schedule to scheduled decision points. Progress monitoring involves collecting and graphing and using data frequently. Progress monitoring also requires plan development including who, what, when, and how frequently data, collected data, are reviewed. You'll learn more about progress monitoring in Module 5. When selecting an intervention, choose one that is explicit and targeted. It can be delivered with integrity and is aligned to Tier 1. In Step 3, it's important for your team to implement the plan with fidelity. Be sure to choose an intervention that is targeted to meet the specific needs of the student. It is important that the intervention be delivered as designed, which means uh, with integrity, and consistently across settings and service providers. Finally, it's helpful if the intervention is directly aligned with Tier 1 instructional objectives. In your participant workbook, you'll find a sample action plan. You'll also find the complete template for moving through the problem-solving process. Finally, the last step is evaluate your plan. You'll need decision rules to determine students' response to the intervention as implemented. A positive response is when the gap seems to be closing or the student is on or above the goal line. If the response is positive, you may continue the intervention with the current goal or consider increasing the goal. A poor or negative response is when the gap continues to widen with no change in the rate of student progress. This occurs when your team, this is when your team will want to refer to your decision rules and determine if the intervention should be changed or intensified. Finally, a questionable response is when the gap is widening but slows considerably. However, the gap is maybe too big at this point and you're not sure what you should do. This may be a time to ask if the intervention was implemented as intended. The problem solving process is cyclical. If the gap stops widening but closure does not occur, Return to step one of the problem-solving process and continue to adapt the intervention until the student meets their goal. When evaluating the plan, you want to determine the effectiveness of the implemented system's support or intervention and make appropriate educational decisions. Some of the guiding questions to consider is, was the system support or intervention successful? Does the plan require more time or monitoring or modification? And do we need to go back to previous steps? One of the resources available to you in this module is the Wyoming Problem Solving Worksheet. You are encouraged to use it in your schools and to work through the problem solving process using real student data. The worksheet will support your team in working through the steps to support improved student academic and behavioral outcomes. In this module, you were introduced to database decision making and the types of decisions that schools may use in an MTSS framework. You were also introduced to the four-step problem solving process and tools to help you and your schools problem solve with students and grade level teams.
Effective problem solving takes practice. Consider doing the extension activity and convene an MTSS school team. You'll find handouts 3.1 and 3.4 will be helpful in you implementing in 3.3 and implementing this activity. Remember, there are a number of resources to help you in your database decision making and teaming process. The Center on Response to Intervention has a series of self-paced modules on implementing database decision making in an RTI or MTSS framework. The RTI Action Network has tools to help guide your team in completing the problem solving process. The National Center on Intensive Intervention has a series of data teaming tools to help you from the beginning establish the meeting agenda all the way through the decision making about what happens to the student when they're not responding. As always, consider accessing the Project WIN website. This is your go-to website for Wyoming MTSS. You can access the site by going to wyominginstructionalnetwork.com and searching for MTSS. Now that you've completed the module, consider completing the quiz in your participant workbook. If you'd like the answers, you need to contact your state MTSS coach, whose information is on the next slide. It's recommended that you convene an MTSS team and practice setting up the problem-solving approach at the student level and at the school level. Use the problem-solving worksheet to help guide your team in a systematic process for data decision-making. Once you've completed these activities, consider completing Module 4, High Quality Tier 1. For more information, contact Bart Lyman, Wyoming State MTSS Coach, or Jennifer Heiler, the Wyoming SPDIG Program Manager. Thank you for participating in this module. We look forward to your participation in the next module.